An idea that one encounters often in topology is the following. Suppose we want to compute some invariant of a topological space X. Then what we may do is chop X into simpler pieces, compute the invariant of each piece separately, and then study how these invariants of the pieces can be glued together to produce the invariant of X. The point of this video is showing that this can be done for the fundamental group, and this goes under the name of the theorem of Van Kampen. In order to see the idea at work, it is probably best if we start with a topological space that can be split into very simple pieces. For this reason, we will use the higher dimensional spheres as our initial example. In the animations, we will see S2, but I invite you to check that all the arguments we do are general and apply to all the higher dimensional spheres. Here is the statement we want to prove. The fundamental group of Sn is zero as long as n is at least two. In particular, this shows that the higher dimensional spheres are not homotopy equivalent to S1 because the circle has non-trivial fundamental group. This proposition appeared already in one of our previous videos. Back then, we provided a non-completely rigorous argument that went basically like this. If we remove a point from Sn, we are left with Rn. This means that Sn can be chopped into two pieces, Rn and a point, and each of these pieces is very simple and has no fundamental group. In this video, we will implement this idea in a completely rigorous way. In the animation, you can see that we've divided S2 into two pieces. The first one, which we call A, is a neighborhood of the northern hemisphere. The second piece, that we call B, is a neighborhood of the southern hemisphere, and we show it in blue. These two open pieces overlap in an equatorial band that we show in green. An observation that you are probably familiar with is that the pieces A and B are in fact homeomorphic to the open disk. That is to say, they are homeomorphic to Rn and thus contractible. The idea behind the proof is to exploit the fact that the pieces are simple and therefore any loop in them can be contracted. Given a loop gamma, we will make a first homotopy to a different loop nu, such that nu is a concatenation of loops coming from each of the pieces separately. Once that is achieved, we will be able to contract the little loops nu i individually and therefore nu itself. Let us go through the details of the proof. Since the sphere is path connected, it doesn't matter which base point we choose in order to compute the fundamental group. However, it is extremely convenient to choose the base point P to lie in the equatorial band that is the intersection. The reason is that we are interested in creating homotopies that present our loops as concatenations of loops coming from each of the pieces. As such, it is good that P lies both in A and in B, and thus we can look at loops based at P and containing either piece. Consider then a loop gamma based at P and depicted in red. The first lemma we need in order to contract gamma is the following. Gamma can be written as a concatenation of paths, finitely many of them, such that each path gamma i is contained in A or in B. This lemma appeared already when we studied the homotopy lifting property and it relies on the compactness of the interval. In the present example, an application of the lemma divides gamma into three pieces that we show in different colors. The first piece is gamma 1, it's shown in pink and it's fully contained in B. The second piece is gamma 2, drawn in orange and also contained in B. And the last piece, gamma 3, is shown in purple and is fully contained in A. It is worth remarking that since gamma 1 and gamma 2 are both contained in B, we could regard their concatenation as a single piece, but for this argument, this is not particularly important. Now, as you see, we are not quite in the situation we wanted. Even though we've chopped gamma into individual pieces contained in A and B, these pieces are not loops, but paths. This means that we cannot contract each gamma i individually, because two consecutive gamma i's meet at a shared endpoint that is probably not P. The way to address this is precisely what we said earlier. Instead of working with gamma, we will create a first homotopy to a curve nu, such that nu really is a concatenation of loops coming from the pieces. Let's see this in practice by going to the shared endpoint of gamma 1 with gamma 2. 
we can define a homotopy of gamma that effectively appends a segment to the end of gamma 1 and the end of gamma 2 in a coherent way and connects the shared endpoint with P. We should emphasize that this sliding of the shared endpoint to P should take place within the intersection of A with B. This is important in order to ensure that each of the pieces really is contained fully in A or fully in B. This points out already the key assumption in the theorem of Van Kampen. The intersection of the two pieces must be path connected. Now we go to the shared endpoint of gamma 2 with gamma 3 and we similarly slide it towards P. The first stage of the argument is now complete. We've shown that gamma is homotopic to another curve nu, such that nu is a concatenation of three loops. Nu3 is fully contained in A, and the loops nu2 and nu1 are fully contained in B. The proof of the proposition is complete by recalling that the pieces A and B have trivial fundamental group, so each of the loops nu i can be contracted within the corresponding piece. The null homotopy of nu is thus the concatenation of the null homotopies of each of the pieces. Let us do a quick recap of what we've just said. We've proven that the fundamental group of all the higher dimensional spheres is zero. The idea was to cover the sphere with two opens homeomorphic to disks and therefore simply connected. The simply connectedness of the pieces is of course very particular to this example, but there are two ingredients that we used that are general. The first one says that any loop can be written as a concatenation of finitely many paths, each of which is contained in one of the pieces. We then combine this with another general lemma that says that if the intersection is path connected, then we can homotope this concatenation of paths into a concatenation of loops containing each of the pieces. Our next goal is to adapt these ingredients to the general case. Let's see how that goes. We consider a topological space X, which we cover with two open sets A and B. Since the fundamental group depends on the path component, we may as well assume that A and B are path connected. However, what is a key assumption is that the intersection should also be path connected. As we saw earlier, this is needed for the argument to work. In fact, I invite you to think about the following example. Take us one and cover it by two open intervals. This is thus a cover of the circle where each of the pieces has trivial fundamental group. And yet, we know that the fundamental group of S1 is isomorphic to the integers. The point is that the two elements of the cover overlap in a set that is not connected, and therefore Van Kampen does not apply. It turns out that one can prove a more general version of Van Kampen that relies on the fundamental groupoid and not on the fundamental group, and allows us to deal with non-path connected intersections. However, this is beyond the scope of this video. Alright, let's go back to our general case. Once we've chopped x into the pieces a and b, it is very natural to consider loops in x that are given as concatenations of loops coming from a and b. If instead of loops we consider homotopy classes of loops, then there's an algebraic counterpart to this process. Namely, we can take the fundamental group of a, the fundamental group of B, and assemble them into a larger group that combines both. This is called the free product of pi 1a and pi 1b. In order to mimic algebraically what is happening on X, what we want is that elements in the free product should be concatenations of elements coming from pi 1a and pi 1b. You should think that the classes in pi 1 of a and pi 1 of b are letters, that we put together to form words in this bigger group. It may happen that two words actually represent the same element in this larger group. Namely, if we have two consecutive letters, both of which come from pi1 of a, we can then compose them to form a single letter. We then say that a word is reduced if the letters alternate from coming from pi1 of a and pi1 of b. What this reasoning shows is that there's a group homomorphism from the free product of pi 1a and pi 1b into pi 1 of x. Namely, given a word which is just a concatenation of elements in either of the pieces, 
we send it to the homotopy class of the loop in X, that is the concatenation of the loops coming from each of the pieces. The first part in the proof of Van Kampen is showing that this group homomorphism is in fact surjective. That is, every loop in X is, up to homotopy, a concatenation of loops coming from A and B. This is exactly what we saw in the particular case of the sphere earlier. Once that is proven, the next step in the proof is to understand what the kernel of Psi is. A first observation in this direction is the following. Consider a loop nu that is based at P and contained in the intersection. By definition, this means that nu can be regarded as a loop in A, and therefore it represents a class in Pi1 of A, but also it can be regarded as a loop in B, and therefore it represents a class in Pi1 of B. Since they come from different groups, these are different as words in the free product. However, when we see them as paths in Pi1 of X, that is, when we map the classes through Psi, they are the same because they correspond to the class of nu in X. This shows that if we concatenate the class of nu coming from A with the inverse of the class of nu coming from B, this will be a word in the free product that is in the kernel of Psi. The theorem of Van Kampen states that this kernel not only contains these words, but is in fact generated by these words. Putting all of this together, the theorem says the following. If we want to compute pi1 of x, what we can do is take the free product of pi1a and pi1b and quotient it by the kernel. That this is isomorphic to pi1 of x is then a consequence of the first isomorphism theorem for groups. Furthermore, this quotient takes place by identifying the elements in pi1a and pi1b that come from pi1 of the intersection. Let us go through this argument once more, but now with a bit of pictorial help. Here we see some topological space X that we've divided into two pieces, A in yellow and B in blue. Their overlap is shown once again in green. The picture is meant to emphasize the fact that the intersection, and also A and B, may have some interesting topology, potentially with very many holes. However, what we must assume for the argument to work is that the intersection is path-connected. Once again, we fix a base point contained in the overlap, and we study loops gamma based at that point. The first thing we do is apply the earlier lemma that tells us that we can chop gamma into some finite number of pieces, each of which is contained in either A or B. In this particular case, we see that gamma once again is divided into three pieces, gamma 1, which is contained in A, gamma 2, that is contained in B, and gamma 3, that is contained in A. Do note that these pieces are paths and not loops. As such, our second step is to use the path connectedness of the intersection to define a first homotopy that replaces gamma by another loop nu, that is now defined as a concatenation of loops containing either piece. This already completes the first part of the theorem. We've shown that any loop gamma in X can be homotoped to be a concatenation of loops coming from the pieces. As such, the class of gamma is in the image of the group homomorphism psi. However, it may happen that the class of gamma is the image of two different words coming from the free product. This could be the case, for instance, if nu3 can be homotoped to be fully contained in the intersection, and therefore also representable by a class in pi1 of b. In order to complete the proof of the theorem, we have to show that the kernel is fully described by this phenomenon. We will not do this in the current video, but let us emphasize that the analysis that must be done to justify this is very similar to what we've done already. Namely, much like we've shown that any loop in X comes as a concatenation of loops in the pieces, we can also show that a homotopy of loops in X can be presented as a concatenation of homotopies coming from A and B. Carrying this out carefully will complete the proof. All right, so this is the end of the video, so let us recap once more what we've said. The main message was that the fundamental group of a topological space X can be computed by chopping it into two open pieces A and B, 
computing the fundamental groups of the pieces individually and then understanding how they glue. This gluing of the fundamental groups was like an algebraic version of the idea that we want to concatenate paths in the pieces to produce paths in X. A first corollary of this result follows by assuming that the pieces are simply connected. Then, because the pieces are simply connected, there's no interesting loops in them, and therefore there's also no loops in the union X. This is precisely what we saw for the higher dimensional spheres at the beginning of the video. A second corollary says the following, if the intersection is simply connected, then pi1 of x is just the free product of the pi1 of the pieces. This follows because pi1 of x is a quotient of the free product, and in the case in which the intersection is simply connected, then there's no quotienting happening. A particular instance of this is when A and B are nicely behaved locally and X is the wedge product. This is for instance the case if we take A and B to be S1. This tells us that the fundamental group of the wedge of S1 with S1 is the free product of Z with itself. Alright, so this is the end of the video. I would suggest that you give some thought to the proof of fun campaign that we've presented and you try to complete its details. That's all for today, so thanks a lot for watching, take care and all the best.